continuing on now with my diagram video for biology. So here we're looking at the excretory system, specifically the kidneys. So I'll just label it up for you. Here's your kidney. Now remember the kidney is responsible for producing urine, which is going to drain to the bladder down here for storage and it drains away in the ureter. Here's that urine storage organ, the bladder, and then lastly the tube out of the body in both males and females is the urethra. I'll attempt to draw this one, but if this is supposed to be one kidney, then plugging into it is that ureter again. Now the outer layer of the kidney is known as the cortex. The middle section is the medulla. This bit where the ureter feeds into the kidney is called the pelvis. And then in terms of where you'd find a single nephron, it looks a little bit like this. So I'm going to go into more detail, but hopefully you can see that characteristic Bowman's capsule going into the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, and then the distal convoluted tubule. So here's that nephron, which you really do need to label. So the blood vessel which enters the nephron is known as the glomerulus. The first part of the nephron is called the Bowman's capsule. And remember, between these two places is where ultrafiltration takes place. Part B we're going to call the proximal convoluted tubule. Proximal meaning first, convoluted meaning coil. Then this longer section is the loop of Henle. Here's the second coil tube or the distal convoluted tubule. And then part D is super important because this is where ADH acts and helps to restore the water balance of the blood. Part D is the collecting duct which will drain into the ureter and then finally the bladder. Quick drawing here of a sperm. Now here is the whiplash tail that helps it to swim. In order to swim, it will need lots of energy. So this midsection here is filled with mitochondria, which release energy. Up here, you have the head of the sperm, which contains the genetic material, which in this case will be a haploid number of chromosomes. And then in the head of the sperm, you find an acrosome, which contains digestive enzymes needed to penetrate the outside of the egg. Right, the female reproductive system. So there are two ovaries. Then you have the fallopian tubes or oviducts feeding into the uterus. This is supposed to resemble the cervix. And then last up, the vagina. So the ovary is where the eggs are made and oestrogen is made. The fallopian tube or oviducts is where fertilization takes place. The uterus is where that embryo grows. The cervix creates a boundary between the uterus and the vagina and then vagina is where copulation takes place. Now we have the male reproductive system which I won't even attempt to draw. Here's the bladder where urine is stored. Down here you have the testes which produce sperm and testosterone. This tube that leads from the testes to the urethra has several names but I'm going to call it the sperm duct. There are several glands which contribute nutrients to that sperm. This tube helps semen and urine leave the body. This fleshy organ here is the penis. And then the sac of skin which holds the testes outside of the body is known as the scrotum. Right, the leaf layer structure. So this is if we were to take a cross section of the leaf you'd find this sort of arrangement. I think most important is that you can label this as opposed to draw it. But if I draw it out for you, you can see how we can build up knowledge of the leaf structure and how that's important in photosynthesis. Right, so we're ready to go. This top layer, therefore, is the waxy cuticle, which is needed to prevent the loss of water from a leaf, which is known as transpiration. Here you have the upper epidermis, 
which is transparent to allow light to enter the leaf. This layer here is known as the palisade mesophyll. These are your characteristic plant cells. They're chock-a-block full of chloroplasts that help carry out photosynthesis because they're filled with chlorophyll. Notice that these cells are tightly packed. Down here you have the spongy mesophyll, which has all important air spaces that allow the important gases of oxygen and carbon dioxide to diffuse. This bit here I'm going to just call the vein which contains the xylem needed to transport water into the leaf and the phloem, which is used to take sucrose and amino acids away from the leaf. Down here you have the lower epidermis and then the all-important guard cells, which control the opening and closing of the stomata, which are effectively holes in the leaf that allow carbon dioxide to enter the leaf for photosynthesis, oxygen to leave, as well as transpiration. What about the arrangement of the phloem and the xylem in both the stem and the root? So again, we're looking at cross sections. So if we take the stem first of all, and take a cross section of the stem, you'll notice this sort of arrangement. The important thing here is to realize that the phloem is the tissue which sits on the outside, whereas the xylem is on the inside. In the root, it looks slightly different. We're going to draw a nice X shape, which handily represents the xylem. And then between each of those crosses, you have the phloem. Insect pollinated flowers now. Again, just be able to label this. So I'm going to draw some bright, colourful, flag-like petals. Right, let's see how we get on with this then. So, as I already said, here are your bright, large, colourful petals, and that's some, something that you'll certainly have in an insect-pollinated flower, as well as a structure down here called the nectary that provides sugar to the insect. Here is the male part of the flower. This bit that holds the pollen is known as the anther, the thin stalk holding the anther in place is known as the filament and together they're known as the stamen. The female part of the plant is over here and it's made up of the stigma, the style and the ovary. And collectively those three structures are known as the carpal. Inside the ovary you find the ovules and the eggs. Just remember for me that when that pollen lands on the stigma and grows a pollen tube down into the ovary, the pollen will enter via what's known as a micropyle. Just to quickly show you a wind-pollinated flower, because it doesn't need to attract insects, you won't get the scent, you won't get the nectar or the large colourful petals, but you will get feathery stigma, which are feathery in order to catch the pollen from the exposed stamen and that pollen will be lightweight so it can easily be carried by the wind. Once I've seen them ask you to draw quadrat so that's just a metal frame used to sample the population of species so something like this will be more than adequate. The main thing is to make sure that you spell it correctly it's a quadrat not a quadrant. Right DNA now this is a very loose drawing just to show that it is a double helix made up of a sugar phosphate backbone. Remember for me that that sugar is called deoxyribose. That's what the D in DNA stands for. And that you find complementary bases in the middle of those rungs, which are made up of A binding to T, C binding to G, and they're held together by hydrogen bonds. Here's a simple fermenter. Why are we using a sterile air supply? That means that the sterile part of it means that there's no pathogens. The air supply means that oxygen is being introduced, which is potentially needed by the microorganism which we're trying to grow as respiration. That nutrients, you'll want something like glucose that the microorganism can feed upon. 
you have a stirrer to mix in those sugars, the oxygen that's been introduced and to also even out the temperature. We have temperature and pH monitors in order to make sure that the enzymes aren't denaturing and then the cooling jacket will, will remove excess heat.